Assalamu alaikum and very good morning. A very warm welcome to each and every one of you. I'm Anata Akila, the moderator for this webinar session today and the representative of the All MCAS and Mining Technical Division, OGMTD. On behalf of the organizing committee, we extend our appreciation for your presence today. Our webinar today is talk on controlling and managing sand production from oil and gas well. Before we start, if you have any question throughout the webinar session, please drop your question in the chat box at the right side of yours on your screen. Okay, let me introduce um, our speaker for today. Our winner today will be presented by Pat Latifianto. Pat Latifianto is a seasoned principal scientist, production technologist at Petronas Research Sunyamberhan, known as PRSB, where he spearheads the development of in-house cutting-edge subsurface technologies through pilot projects. He holds a bachelor degree in mechanical engineering from Institute Technology Bandung and a master degree in petroleum engineering from IFB School. Pat Latif has accumulated more than 20 years of expertise in the oil and gas industries. Prior to joining Petronas Research, he has worked with the Total Indonesia and Petronas Charigali, where he played a key role in providing technical assurance for field development projects, FTP and well service. Other than pilot projects, Palatif also holds the responsibility for well completion design, well integrity and production, injection technical assurance in various in various carbon capture and storage CCS project in Malaysia. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let us start our webinar session today by welcoming Pak Latif Ento to press with the webinar presentation. Please welcome Pak Latif Ento. Hi, uh, thank you, Anati, for the introduction. Uh, selamat pagi and a very good morning to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here with you uh, on Saturday morning. Uh, to present this talk. This is the first time for me uh, attending the IEM, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I I didn't know about it before until my superior uh, assigned me uh, to give a talk. But uh, hopefully it's, uh, it's better late than never, right? So uh, looking forward to, to have more engagement session with you, uh, either as a speaker or as a participant. Right? Uh, my, you can, you can hear my voice clearly, right? Just uh, maybe do a sound testing first. Anati. Oh, yes, okay? Thank you. All right. So, so the title of my presentation is Controlling and Managing Sand Production from Oil and Gas Well. All right. Uh, all right. So, what uh, I will be covering today is more like a sand control 101. So we are going to talk about everything that you need to know uh, in controlling and managing sand control from oil and gas uh, well, um, but with a little bit of detail. So, but if you're interested in any particular subject uh, during the presentation, uh, you can ask. Any specific topic that you're interested in. Yeah. So uh, we can start with the the first question like why uh, preventing uh, sand, con sand production uh, from our oil and gas well matter to us what, what are the consequences of uh, uncontrolled sand production okay. uh, and then we can continue with the uh, what mechanism that govern the sand production in oil what costs the sand production okay uh, and the next question is uh, how can sand production be predicted or forecasted, right? And uh, what are the techniques that normally use for us to detect and to monitor sand production? Um, and then we continue with the, with the various strategy and technology that we employ to mitigate and to prevent sand production. And the last, not least, is to uh, discuss further or uh, whether, whether this is a good, good idea to allow sand to be produced and manage uh, the risk at surface. All right, my first encounter with the sand production started back to 20 years ago when I was still working with 
total Indonesia. At the time, uh, we were managing or operating one of the largest uh, gas field uh, back in Indonesia, in Kalimantan, offshore Kalimantan. We were producing around 2.6 billion scuff of gas every day. Uh, at, at one day, uh, uh, we, I received a report from the operation that one of the remote platform was uh, shut down. Uh, and then when we sent the operator to visit the platform, uh, they found out that that the pipeline was badly eroded. So uh, they found a hole uh, at the elbow after the after the choke, the first elbow after the choke, right? Uh, it was a gas well. So when they arrived on that location, uh, the platform was full with the uh, gas cloud, basically hydrocarbon gas. So it was uh, it was a near miss for us. So. Uh, this is the first problem that uh, encounter uh, that I encounter personally uh, with the same production. and this is the the, the main issue uh, the main issue that uh, that then caused by uh, sand production in oil and gas oil right so uh, uh, sand at high velocity can cause loss of primary containment so uh, the picture that you see here in the bottom left is just an example how bad the damage that can uh, that the sand can cause to the production facilities, right? So um, I think most of you are familiar with with the uh, with the fire triangle. Uh, I can probably zoom in here, All right? So uh, the fire can be created by combination of three elements, right? You have oxygen, you have fuel, and you have heat. As long as we keep these three elements uh, isolated, separated. Uh, there won't be any fire, right? So we can prevent fire by keep these three elements separated, right? But the problem with the with the erosion is that the moment we the erosion happen and our mechanical integrity of the pipeline uh, jeopardize or compromise, then you're going to have combination or exposure of the uh, fuel, which is our gas, with the oxygen, which is available in our air. Right. So at that point of time, it just requires a spark or uh, heat to create fire. So we were that close to the disaster at the time. Right. So that's the first, I think, the major concern uh, uh, from the erosion caused by sand production. Uh, other than that, uh, the, the moment we have this uh, pipeline eroded, then uh, there's a very high risk that we might cause a oil spill. So there's an environment hazard on that. So the, the, the oil spill uh, might go, you know, in your know, platform, you know, you, you can have oil spill in the, on the sea, right? So, um, so that, that's the, the, two, the two, two main uh, issue dealing with the erosion due to sand production, the fire hazard and environment hazard. So this is likely occur at the surface uh, flow line or pipeline because uh, at the surface, uh, this is where you you are going to have a more band, uh, unlike in the in the well. In the well, 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 that's really simple, right? You don't have really a, a 90 degree band or elbow inside the well. So the more band, uh, the higher the, the likely that that we, we might have erosion. Okay. So another another issue with erosion is probably some of you are familiar. Uh, we we know that erosion can accelerate corrosion because uh, any 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 passive protection layer then we have to protect the corrosion for the corrosion can be eroded or can be removed easily uh, due to the erosion right. so this is example uh, uh, let me let me zoom in here right uh, this is from uh, when you say bin is a choke is the is the device that we use to control the production this is how how bad the bin condition, uh, just bear in mind, this bin is made of metal, or uh, some of them are made of tungsten carbide, yeah? But um, they cannot survive with uh, uh, at the presence of the sand with high, the higher velocity. So there are, there are a few factors that are affecting the uh, erosion. Uh, first, definitely, is velocity. Uh, second is the uh, sand production rate. Uh, the grain size of the sand itself, 
and the roundness, like the uh, how round the sand, the sand will affect how bad uh, the erosion rate it will be. So that's the first problem. The, the second problem that we encounter uh, with the sand production is sand deposition, right? It can happen both in downhole or at the surface facility. Uh, what you see here at the bottom left, in fact, is one of our worker uh, who is digging the sand uh, in our separator. Okay. Uh, I, I took the picture just for example, just to show how how severe uh, the sand deposition can be, right? So we we normally do this uh, during the uh, turnaround period when we shut down our facilities and we, when we, we clean all the facilities from sand. Uh, we also have a, a practice to record the amount of sand that we recover uh, in each facility. So when we plot it in the uh, over time, uh, we can see whether the the same accumulation tend to increase over time. Because bear in mind, uh, whatever we produce from well, let's assume that we have 100 or 200 wells, uh, everything will be accumulated in our facilities. So our facilities, uh, if we plot the amount of sand accumulated in our facility over time, that will give indication uh, whether, whether, the, whether the, the, the problem is getting worse over time or not. Right. Um, all right. So uh, it happened both in downhole inside the well and at the surface facilities. Um, so in downhole, whenever whenever sand accumulated in downhole, normally because of the velocity is too low to lift the sand to the surface, then you can imagine that this sand accumulation over time will, you know, will will create a, a restriction for the well to flow. Right. So at, at one point that uh, the well won't be able to produce anymore because of the sand deposition inside the well. Okay, so uh, that require well intervention and well intervention and also the surface facility in, uh, cleaning process is costly manager, right? So uh, just take for example in the pipeline, uh, the uh, the more sand deposition that we have, the then we need to schedule the Pigging uh, frequency higher. We, we need to schedule more pigging uh, to, to clean out the sand, right? So uh, and then this uh, sand deposition inside the vessel also will give extra scope uh, during the turnaround uh, for our uh, facilities. Uh, so the sand deposition could impact both the production and our operational expenditure. Okay. The third problem is probably less obvious compared to the first two, um, but uh, let me zoom in first. Uh, this is we're talking about uh, the flow assurance issue. Uh, it could be specific to a certain case, but the problem is real. So uh, let's take example for for, some, uh, for this case where we are producing a wax secret, right? So. Um, it, when, when we are producing waste crude, uh, there is a possibility that we might have a waste deposited uh, inside the pipeline or tubing, and then we need to do a regular cleaning, uh, which is which is uh, normally do. Uh, the problem is uh, sand present in the pipeline that provide uh, basically nucleation site for the wax crystal to grow. So um, removing the sand alone is hard. Removing the wax alone is also hard, but both are doable. But removing sand in wax in combination, that one is even harder, right? So that's that's the um, the problem that we, we may face uh, when we combine uh, sand production with the uh, wax deposition, right? Um, the next example here is the emulsion, the sands or fine sands. Uh, is known as the emuls emulsifying agent. Okay, so uh, when it's emulsifying agent is something that tend to provoke or stabilize the emulsion. Uh, I want to draw attention uh, on this chart. Um, so this is this chart showing the viscosity of uh, the fluid uh, in function of the water cut. So uh, when the water cut zero means we are producing only oil. Okay, when water cut 100 
I mean, we are producing almost 100% water. Yeah. Um, so uh, if, when, when we are producing only oil, uh, the viscosity at 28 degrees C is around one. This is just an example, right? And we all know that viscosity of water is also around one centipoise. So it's not a big deal. The problem is when we start having a mixture of water and oil, and these two immiscible fluid form emulsion, you can see the impact in the viscosity here, right? So uh, I think uh, you can see that that the viscosity uh, start increasing as the water cut increase. Okay. Uh, at at the water cut of 50, I mean at the water cut 50 minutes, you have a half of oil and half of water, and they form an emulsion. The the viscosity can reach 10 centipoise at a time. So it's one order of magnitude higher than uh, oil alone. Yeah. So it can it can get worse, right? Uh, you know, it can, the the viscosity can reach 100 centipoise in the, in this case, yeah, which is two order of magnitude at 80 uh, percent of water cut. But this is you cannot generalize this. We, 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 what I want to say is uh, that the correlation is there. Uh, emulsion will create uh, will make the fluid more viscous. Okay. So what will be the, the, the consequence of having this viscous fluid? By, by having viscous fluid, basically we are creating more pressure drop in the system. Okay. And with more pressure drop in the system, basically less oil production. So at the end of the day, it will impact our production. So that's the first uh, uh, problem. So less oil production. The second problem uh, is the water that we produce we need to separate it from the oil before we can uh, dispose it maybe overboard. There are certain quality that we need to meet uh, before we allow uh, to, to dump the, the, the water overboard or to dispose the water inside the disposal well, right? And then the fact that we have a stable emulsion is making it even harder for us to separate oil and water. So uh, to meet that, specific requirement, uh, they call it oil in water, uh, certain oil in water before we dispose the well, it will be a really challenging task, right? So uh, this is just to illustration uh, of the emulsion at a different degree of uh, stability, okay? Uh, if you look at from the left over here, uh, let, me, let me put pointer first, okay? So from the left to the right, you have more more stable to the less stable one. So in a in the most stable uh, in, in the most stable emulsion, uh, you barely can uh, separate between these two invisible fluid. So it's it's as if you only have one face. Okay, uh, even though you know it consists of uh, water and oil, right? And going to the right, this is where the stability uh, drop. So if you have a low stability of emulsion, uh, you know you, you can see a different phase start to uh, start to appear. So you have oil at the top and water uh, at the bottom, but in between you still have some emulsion, though that not many. But it's it's completely different story when you are talking about the first uh, picture on the left. Yeah. So this is a very stable emulsion. So sand or fines or clay present will uh you know will 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 kind of promote uh, this stable emulsion make it harder for us to separate uh later all right so okay so the question is um we we sometimes learn uh, a bit too late like uh, the experience that that i had when I 20 years ago, uh, you know, the remote platform where that was shut down because of the same production, uh, we knew it too late, right? We, we didn't expect that to happen, uh, to be honest with you. But, but in, in most of the cases, right, the requirement to predict the same production came very early during the field development, okay? Uh, the reason being is uh, we need to design the well, okay? We need to design the well uh, in, in such a way uh, to prevent that same production if we expect that to happen. Right? Uh, 
and then uh, designing and drilling the well is not is not an easy job. Uh, is one thing. Second is it takes a lot of time uh, for for the preparation. You have a long lead item, so the best is to have things right from the beginning. Right. So the decision whether we need a sand control in our well or not must be made before even drilling development well. Okay. At, at that point of time, we might have a few wells drill, uh, you know, exploration well or appraisal well, and then from that uh, we need to, you know, we, we require as much as information that we 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 need uh, for us to uh, to come up with the with the answer. So the, the, the question is, uh, first question that we need to answer is, uh, without sand control, is sand production expected? Okay, so uh, like how likely is going to happen? Or maybe a, a more specific, when is going to happen, right? Uh, if it is going to happen late in the well life, probably we can live without sand control in the beginning because sand control require investment. Okay, uh, so, and then uh, if you do require sand control, what would be the best method to control the sand production? Right. And then uh, another question that we can ask is, um, we, if we select one particular method, how that would, imp would impact the production target and the, you know, the, the cash flow uh, at the end of the day? Yeah. So, um, so we need the point here is we need to predict the same production before even we drill our development well. Yeah. So how do we how how, how can we predict? This is our I would say crystal ball. Yeah. Um, the the simplest way, but not necessarily probably the simplest and the 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 most basic way is probably to learn from our from analog field. Like uh, if we if you have a field nearby that share so many things in common with the one that we are going to develop, uh, we can use, you know, their maybe their practice uh, as our guide whether we require sand control or not. Uh, we can look at, uh, basically we look at our neighbors, right? But but make sure that uh, this field is really analog. Yeah. So we we can check whether. Uh, what kind of sand control they use, uh, whether it works, anything that we can learn from our neighbors, I think will be beneficial for us. Okay, uh, that's the first method. This, the second method is uh, we can run a uh, lock, uh, electric lock in our well. Bear in mind, we only have few well at a time and then that, that well probably has been abandoned already. So no, before we before we go to the development well, we normally drill few well, uh, exploration well or appraisal well. Well, the intention is to acquire information, not to produce oil and gas, yeah? Only to acquire information, okay? Uh, to have to improve our understanding on the on the reservoir itself, on the reserve. Uh, so, uh, and at that time, we, we took opportunity uh, to, to run a lock. One of them is sonic lock. Sonic lock is basically to measure uh, how fast this uh, sound travel between emitter and receiver. And based on that sonic lock, we can have some idea uh, whether we are dealing with the uh, formation that likely to produce sand or uh, a consolidated formation that is not going to produce sand. So that sonic lock uh, will give you some idea, some hint. Okay. Uh, the third one is we can also uh, we can also learn uh, observe uh, what uh, any 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 basically any finding uh, during the exploration and appraisal well uh, maybe not so much in exploration but more on the appraisal because in appraisal well we 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 often test the well you know test the well and then during this well test uh, we can check we can see whether whether we are producing sand or maybe we can deliberately uh, test the well uh, to, 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 to check, to, to explore the limit at which point this appraisal well will produce sand. Okay. Uh, but the, 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 the three methods, analog field, sonic log, observation uh, in exploration, they are not perfect, right? So the best is to create a, what we call a geomechanic model. All the, all the information that we have uh, from 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 these three previous uh, method, we can uh, incorporate in geomechanic well. Okay, 
uh, geomechanic well will tell us, uh, um, you know, which or when we are going to produce sand, which formation uh, we are going, uh, which formation is likely to produce sand, and uh, they can come up with the, you know, uh, what we call as a sand producing envelope. Uh, uh, let me zoom in here. Uh, this is one example from the geomechanic model. Um, so the one when you see red is this is a uh, uh, danger zone. This is a, a an area where we are going to produce sand. Uh, green is a safe zone, right? So uh, in the y-axis you see uh, bottom hole flowing temperature, basically of pressure. Eh, sorry, bottom hole flowing pressure. So basic basically pressure a downhole uh, at the bottom of the well. Uh, in the x-axis, you see a reservoir pressure. So this can guide us basically uh, at which bottom hole flowing pressure we need to operate to prevent sand be, to, to be produced. Okay. So that's that's what we call a sand uh, envelope. Yeah. And then uh, uh, this chart also this uh, log. Uh, you see the the last column here. Uh, we call it CDDP. Is basically to guide us uh, which formation is weak, which formation is strong. Okay. So whenever you have C CDDP zero here, touching the 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 zero point at this point, uh, it means that the, the formation is so weak uh, that whatever, no matter what no matter what you do, we are going to produce sand anyway. Right. So uh, so. But but model is like model. Model as good as the input. I think you 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 know garbage in garbage out, right? So uh, the model is as good as the input. The more information that we have to build the model, then the more uh, confident we can use uh, uh, on the outcome on the result. All right. So let's talk about uh, stress, uh, rock stress. Yeah. Uh, the reason why uh, I'm, uh, we cover rock stress because this is one of the uh, this is one of the factor that, uh, that govern the sand production. It's okay, stress stress is tensor, so we need to define two things: uh, the magnitude and the orientation. Okay, the magnitude and the uh, orientation. Yeah. So let, let's talk about magnitude first. Okay. Uh, if you look at here. Uh, we model uh, the stress at the rock with three orthogonal uh, normal stress. Okay, uh, we call it vertical stress, okay, SV, one vertical stress and two horizontal stress. That's that's how we we model the stress uh, at the rock. Yeah. So and then you can have a combination between these three. Uh, this combination between the three, uh, the magnitude, yeah, uh, will determine the 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 fault regime, I would say. Most of the area is a normal stress, a normal fault regime here, where uh, the the vertical stress is the highest, uh, followed by uh, maximum horizontal stress and minimum horizontal stress. Okay, so um, let, let's talk about the the vertical stress. Uh, vertical stress is is we call we call often as a overburden stress. So this is this represent the weight of the rock above the the formation. Okay, the but the weight so it's correlated with the with the depth. So the deeper the deeper you go, uh, the higher the vertical stress will be. Okay, because you have a um, you know a thicker rock uh, uh, above the formation. Yeah, while so, uh, so that's the normal, normal, normal uh, fault regime. In normal fault regime, uh, vertical stress is the highest. But in other cases where the te the tectonic is quite strong, you can have these two other uh, fault regime. Okay. For example, uh, in the strike slip, the highest is not the the vertical. The highest is maximum horizontal stress. If you look at the maximum horizontal stress, followed by a vertical stress and the least is still the minimum horizontal stress okay in the extreme case right the the overburden stress 
this vertical stretch can be the minimum out of the three. Yeah, so that's that's in terms of the magnitude. Uh, but um, let's let's move into to the next uh, picture here um, because when we model uh, the rock as three orthogonal, um, uh, it is easy to imagine uh, before we drill a hole. Yeah, but when 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 we drill the hole, uh, it is easier for us to work in the polar coordinate. So if if you look at if you see here, uh, we call it a near well bore, I mean, which around the hole, yeah. Uh, in, in, in near well bore area, uh, we need to convert this Cartesian coordinate, which is uh, x, y, z, okay, into a uh, polar coordinate. Okay, so instead of uh, three uh, orthogonal stress, uh, three orthogonal stress in form of the vertical and two horizontal stress, now, in the near well bore area, you are going to have a radial stress, yeah, which is a uh, you know uh, a radial uh, in in radial direction. You have axial uh, stress, uh, you know, uh, along the axis of the hole, and you also have tangential or hoop stress okay, along the hole perimeter. Okay, this is the same stress. It just we transform it, we convert from Cartesian into polar coordinate. All right, so that's that's on the magnitude. Okay, uh, now we are talking about the 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 direction. Okay, orientation. So uh, for vertical stress, is you know is straightforward. Uh, it's vertical, so the, the direction is always vertical, right? But now the, the question is for this two horizontal stress, we need to define the azimuth. Um, and, and how how can we how can we uh, how can we know uh, the, the the horizontal stress direction, right? So one one way to to know it is by 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 observing uh, the shape of the the hole that we drill, uh, and and in, in order for us to do that we need to run you know uh, a log uh, image log, right? Um, this is this is the 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 the, the usual uh, shape that we have so you 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 will find a portion where we have a breakout we call it breakout here uh all right yeah let me zoom in yeah breakout here right and uh 90 degree of it you have what we call uh, a portion uh, which uh, which fail because of the tensile so they are always 90 degree apart Right, uh, but by knowing this, by knowing uh, which azimuth basically the breakout and the stand style crack happen, uh, we can work, kind of infer uh, which direction is maximum horizontal stress and minimum horizontal stress. Okay, so um, like in this case, right, the maximum horizontal stress is always uh, parallel to the tensile crack because the breakout occur because of the compressive strain. So this, this hoop stress, basically this maximum horizontal stress is translated into uh, hoop stress, compressive stress, and the, the failure, the breakout will occur 90 degree of it from it. Yeah, so uh, knowing this uh, condition of the well bore, um, that will help us to uh, uh, define the orientation of uh, our minimum and maximum horizontal stress. All right, so I mentioned about a uh, geomechanical model uh, just now, right? Uh, when when we talk about the uh, same prediction, uh, if you look at here, uh, remember the, the the vertical stress represent the weight of the rock. So if we know the rock density, uh, if you know the rock density, then we can integrate it. The work density of a depth uh, to get the weight, right? So uh, the the key here for us to come up with the vertical stress is to get the density profile of, of uh, with depth. So uh, if we have the, the density profile of with depth, we can calculate the vertical stress. Okay, and but that's not the only the only data that we require to build a geomechanical model. Okay, we require not only the uh, a density profile but we also require 
the pressure of the formation. Uh, the pressure of formation, we require the minimum horizontal stress value okay, and maximum horizontal, uh, maximum horizontal stress value and orientation and rock strength. So there are a lot of, lot of uh, input and data required uh, for us to build a geomechanical uh, model. I'm, I'm not a geomechanic. Uh, I'm just a user. So uh, I let geomechanic to build uh, the model and then I just use it. But uh, based on the model that they have, uh, they can build this kind of um, profile. You know, like I mentioned uh, earlier on that you look at this chart, right? Uh, this is representing the the uh, vertical stress. Uh, as I said, vertical stress is correlated with depth. Uh, the deeper you go, uh, the higher the vertical stress will be because of the weight of the rock above it. And then uh, having the geomechanical mechanic will also help you to build this uh, minimum horizontal stress profile, right? Uh, the, you can see here the minimum horizontal stress profile uh, is not necessarily straightforward. You, you, you can always have profile uh, up and down. Yeah, the stress, and uh, this is the pore, pore pressure. When we say pore pressure, is the rest of pore pressure distribution over there. Okay. All right. So we talked about stress just now, uh, which is basically a external uh, force acting on the rock. Now we are. Uh, going to cover about the rock strength, the, in, in the, the, the characteristic of the rock itself. Uh, the table that you see here is basically a, a simple way uh, to classify rock based on its strength, right? Um, we use uh, three parameters here, uh, UCS, which stands for Uniaxial Compressive Strength. Uh, we will talk about it later. Uh, Young Modulus, E, uh, and Porosity. Basically, uh, you know, like a, a beach sand, a dry beach sand has UCS zero, no, no strength at all. Yeah. Uh, but uh, if you add a bit more water uh, into that sand and make it damp, damp then uh, you, you can build a sand castle. That, that, that damp sand, has a, that damp sand has, a, has a strength, okay? So because of the cap capillary force. Uh, but but still, it, they are not cemented. So each sand grain is a loose grain. They are attached because of the capillary force only, right? Um, but if you have a, a weakly cemented uh, sand grains, uh, then you, you can see that, that the EUCS increase uh, by having that. So the, the the stronger the bonding, the, the stronger the, the the cementing part, uh, the, the 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 cementing material between the grain. Then you can expect a stronger rock. Okay. Uh, you can you can see here like we, we use often UCS just to give some idea how weak and how strong the rock is. But uh, bear in mind there is always a gray area. Like uh, UCS land one UCS less than one thousand we consider is weak. Okay, UCS higher than four thousand we consider as strong or consolidated. But anything in between is gray area. Like uh, if you are dealing with the rock with uh, UCS more than 4,000, high chance you are going to produce sand. So in this case, we can live without sand control. Okay, if you if you know that the rock has UCS less than 1,000, then uh, a high chance that you are going to produce sand. So might as well we complete our well, we design our well um, with the sand control. Okay, the, the, the tricky part, the, the challenging part is if you're dealing with something in gray area. Okay. That, that makes things more, you know, uh, uh, interesting. Okay. Um, let, me, let me show you uh, what I mean by uh, UCS. UCS stands for Uniaxial Compressive Strength. This is not the only uh, core test uh, that we, we conduct. Uh, this is considered as one of the simplest one. The way the way we set up the specimen, the specimen is the core. Uh, for those who are not familiar, is core is a sample of rock we we acquire during uh, normally during exploration or appraisal well. Uh, we running whole special 
uh, tool to core. Uh, remember, this is uh, we're talking about 2,000, 3,000 meter below the ground, right? And then we we retrieve a uh, you know a, a core, a sample of rock, and then from the sample we 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 take uh, we plug basically we plug uh, this specimen. The specimen is quite small. The specimen is uh, normally one inch in diameter uh, with two inch of length. So the idea is we are going to apply pressure in one direction. That's why it's called it a uniaxial. We we apply pressure in one direction and when we continue applying the pressure until the rock fill, until the rock broken, basically. Yeah, this is the, the the example of how the log the the, the specimen uh, break. Okay, okay. Let, let, let me go through a little bit more here, right? While during while we are while we are applying the pressure, we measure three things basically. We measure the the force itself, how much uh, force we apply uh, uh, to the specimen to the core, and we also measure the deformation. Deformation is uh, both uh, radial and also axial because the moment we apply the force you can expect that the length is going to be shortened but at the same time the diameter probably extended a little bit so we, we measure that uh, that deformation we call it a, a radial and axial strain yeah so in this condition if you take analogy with the stress that actually rock uh, experience this is much simplified form because in this case, we only have, you know, vertical stress, call it vertical stress, press, uh, stress in one direction, yeah? Uh, while the sigma two and sigma three, yeah, is zero. But in reality, uh, the rock that, that run the rock in, in, in the formation, they have, they have uh, three stresses, okay? Vertical and two horizontal. But in here, we just simplify it. So, <clears throat> um, so this is the the, 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 the the typical result from the UCS data. Uh, you have, you know, on the left, uh, if you follow the my my cursor here, uh, on the left you have a radial strain, okay, and then on on the right you have axial strain. Okay. Uh, so this is this is the the radial and axial strain, and then um, based on that also we also take a note on, on uh, when exactly the specimen break okay so that's the ucs value uh, we can we can sensitize uh, the test with a different condition for example uh, as it is uh, the as it is with the with the native fluid inside the uh, specimen uh, we can also saturate the the core with water uh, okay so if you, you see three graph here it at, at three different conditions basically Okay, so um, this is this is considered accurate uh, data, accurate test to to measure um, uh, both young modulus. Uh, we you can get young modulus from here because we measure the stress and strain, uh, and we also get the UCS value. Okay, the problem is this test is conducted or representative only at one point along the well. You know, we drill we drill a. Uh, 3,000, 4,000 meter of well, right? And our specimen is only one inch in diameter. Okay. One inch in diameter. So it's basically one point along the horizontal. The, the question is, we cannot do this, uh, you know, uh, 3,000 times, uh, or we, we have a limited uh, in quantity that we can test uh, we, to, uh, for in this method, right? It's, it's accurate, but, uh, is a uh, is represent only one point in the world so how can we get the the idea uh, the information how can we how can we get the profile basically uh, because one depth doesn't mean anything right so to answer that we need to build the rock strength versus depth okay uh, we we use log basically uh, to derive uh, this rock strength versus depth and then we use the. If you look at here, uh, let me let me zoom in uh, first on this chart. All right. So the the continuous. Uh, uh, this is the predicted UCS from the uh, from our model. 
Okay, and the point that you see here, the 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 red square, is the UCS data. So um, we are going to use the UCS as our calibration point, basically. Okay. So uh, the the best model is the one that can match uh, the UCS, which is not always happen. Uh, so, but the point here is uh, we can only uh, do a core test. Uh, in few or in some points, a limited uh, number of points, uh, while at the same time we need to build a rock strength profile along the welder. Yeah, in in order for to do that, we need uh, we need some locks. Uh, first, uh, definitely we need a density lock. Uh, second, I mentioned uh, previously also about sonic lock, and then we use uh, basically mathematical equation okay, to derive this continuous rock strength profile versus depth. Uh, before calibration, whenever we just rely on this uh, mathematical uh, equation, we call the, the 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 profile as a dynamic dynamic rock strength. Okay. Only after we calibrate uh, to the to the core test, uh, we co convert it into a static strength. Okay. All right. So I, I, I we we talk about we talk about the. Uh, we talk about the rock stress and rock strength. Uh, the reason why I, I I cover that part because because we will require these two parameters to explain why we produce sand. Okay, there are two conditions uh, that are required to happen for a well to produce sand. Okay, the first condition is when the stress outweighs the rock strength. Okay, when the stress exceeds the strength. So at that point of time, the rock will fail. When 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 we say fail, it's broken. Okay, because as long as the rock is still intact, we are not going to produce sand. So that sand grain will be glue or cemented one to with another. So there won't be no sand production. So the first condition that we need to meet is we need to have stress which exceed the rock strength. Okay, that's the condition one. Uh, but that is not. There is, that one is necessary but not sufficient. Yeah, the, the second condition might, might, must happen also that this broken sand is transported to the surface. So if these two conditions happen, then we are going to see sand production at the surface. Okay. okay. Um, so what, 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 what we can say, right? What we can say from here is that in order for us to prevent or to, to control the same production, we just need to have at least one of the condition or preventing one of the condition to occur. Yeah. So either condition one or condition two, as long as we prevent one of them uh, from happening, we can prevent a same uh, production. All right, so how do we know if we are producing sand? Because um, we don't want to be caught by surprise, uh, you know, having, you know, LOBC having our pipeline eroded, uh, maybe a fire incident. No, we, we wanted to know much earlier than that. We want to know if we are producing sand, right? So uh, these are the methods that uh, we use normally. Uh, but but the, the idea is if, if we knew it earlier, right, if we knew it earlier, we can mitigate the risk. Yeah, we can prevent a major consequence of producing sand. Yeah, just like in the old saying, like uh, you can't improve what you can measure. But that's that's basically what we are trying to do. We want to measure so we can improve. So um, we I start with the the, the simplest one. Uh, the simplest one is the sand concentration measurement, right? Uh, it is quite simple. Uh, I'll cover it uh, in the next slide. Uh, um, we we know, we can we can do manual sand sampling or we can catch the uh, sand through a descender or a screen and measure the quantity of uh, sand produced. Uh, that's the first method. The second method is uh, acoustic sand monitoring, uh, uh, as its name. We the the device rely on the uh, acoustic signal uh, to basically determine whether the well is producing sand or not. Okay, uh, and the, the third one is the erosion rate monitoring. So the third one is basically measure the impact uh, and the consequence, the erosion itself, not the, the sand concentration. Okay. 
All right, so let, let's start with the, the, the most common one. This is the most common one. Um, uh, it's quite simple. Uh, we just purge uh, our produce fluid, uh, maybe five to eight liter uh, into a jerry can. Uh, and then we strain the, the, the fluid. We only catch the sand. Uh, once we catch the sand, we wash it. Uh, maybe I, I need to zoom in the, so it's easier for you to imagine. Okay, so uh, basically we purge, uh, we strain, uh, and uh, the remaining, uh, the, the retained sand, the retained sand, yeah? We, we strain it with the 45 or 25 micro normally. So we, we are going to retain anything bigger than that. Uh, we wash the sand just to make sure that we get rid of this, uh, any organic content. Uh, and then we weight it. So by after weighting, uh, well, basically, uh, there's also uh, this one part of the cleaning process. Uh, we we wash with acetone, we dry the sand. So it, it, it takes quite some time. You are not going to get the the result immediately, but once once the sand is dry, we weigh it. Uh, we can calculate the sand concentration. We 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 use normally PPD, which stand for pound per thousand barrel. So pound of sand per thousand barrel of fluid. So that's the simplest one. The, the problem with this method is we cannot apply this in a gas well because a purging gas, uh, first a purging gas, it is very hard to to collect sufficient liquid in a in a in a gas well, right? Uh, not always easy. And then at that, at that point of time, we might release too much gas to the environment. So uh, to overcome this, uh, we 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 have it is not always available, but uh, uh, is by call out basis. We can bring in a mini separator. Basically, we have we we reroute the part of the gas to this mini separator. Okay, and then uh, we collect the the amount of uh, liquid and sand, and then we do the measurement. Yeah. So so this is a direct measurement of the the, the plus point for this is direct measurement of uh, sand concentration. Uh, it, it's a non intrusive. Okay. Uh, the drawback is uh, we cannot do it continuously. It's periodic. For example, uh, in the current practice, we do it uh, or once a month uh, or once a week if necessary, depending on the severity of the same production. But it will never be continuous. But the question that we can always ask ourselves is, if we do it only once a month, how can we make sure that the, the next 29 days, uh, we are going to have the same rate? result right because in any case we are extrapolating something so there is high uncertainty on this okay the sample might not be representative uh, it, it could be representative for that point of time uh, let alone uh, the, the flow regime might also affect the amount of sand that we collect uh, during the sampling method the second method is uh, easy to apply because it's not non-intrusive so you can basically attach this acoustic uh, device anywhere. Normally we, we attach it on the first elbow uh, because we rely on the, if you look at here, um, look at here, we rely on the uh, sand particle impingement uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the wall, to the pipeline wall basically. So whenever, whenever it hit the wall, it will create a, a signal, uh, noise basically. And this this acoustic device will capture that. Okay, this sound uh, easy and practical, right? Okay, uh, I give you one uh, example uh, here. Uh, this is this is the actual uh, acoustic sound monitoring result that we conducted. Uh, the, the problem with this uh, is that this is all relative. First, uh, let me let me go to the plus and negative plus and minus okay, for this method. Uh, the, the plus one is a real time. So uh, you can you can put this this uh, acoustic device, uh, attach it to the to the elbow, and then you can monitor 24 seven. As long as the device is there, then you can see, uh, I would say, uh, whether the well is producing sand or not. Okay, now the plus point is easy to install. It's not intrusive. The drawback is it is qualitative. 
we won't be able to come up with the, let's say, oh, this one is producing with, uh, let's say, 100 PPDB, okay, pound per thousand barrel, cannot. The device is not capable to do that. Okay, the reason being is this acoustic device record all the noises, not exactly the one that is created by sound. Okay. Ideally, ideally, uh, you can talk to any acoustic uh, uh, sound monitoring company. Ideally, we should have done calibration. Calibration made, uh, by by monitoring the noise before any sound production. So by, by knowing the background noise, then you can eliminate it later. But a few things that, that the problem is, uh, nobody has done it because uh, in order for you, uh, in most of the cases, the well is already producing sand. Okay. So the, the background noise already contains sand. That's the first. Uh, the, the, the second is the, the background noise is changing over time. Like the background noise is valid only at that particular time. But the moment you produce more gas, the moment you produce more oil or more water, right? Uh, then the background noise won't be the same. So theoretically, you have to repeat this process over and over again. But by that time, the well is already producing sand. Unfortunately, uh, it, it's also affected by uh, the the flow regime, like how how dense the fluid, uh, how small the particle, the same particle is, because uh, if you look at this, um, the, the way the same particle impact, uh, impinge the wall might be different in this three scenario. Okay, depending on the fluid density, depending on the particle size, uh, it's different. Yeah, so you have a high chance to hitting the impinge, the, you have the high chance that the sand will impinge the wall when you're dealing with the you know, low fluid density and maybe large and heavy particle which is quite common for gas well. So this is, this is, this is quite common of, condition number three is common for gas well. Yeah. So uh, let, let, let me zoom in first on here. So let, let's, let's take example. For example, it's all relative, okay? It's all qualitative, not quantitative. Uh, if you look at here, we can say that uh, at this point of time, uh, we have, we are certain that we produce solid, Okay, um, how much we don't know, but definitely it's more than uh, this period. Okay, uh, but we can also rule out that there is no sand production here. We cannot rule out because we have we haven't done any uh, calibration. Uh, in order for for you to to convert from qualitative to quantitative, what they suggest in addition to this uh, background noise uh, elimination is to inject deliberately a certain amount of sand. Deliberately, yeah? So they have a device where they inject a certain amount of sand and then they record the noise. So by having this, you can convert qualitative measurement to quantitative measurement. But unfortunately, nobody that I know has done it because it's too troublesome. It's not practical. So uh, in, in most of the cases, we just need to have to be happy with this qualitative measurement. Yeah. The the last uh, method of monitoring is uh, well when we monitor the erosion rate itself, not the sand concentration, but the erosion rate. Okay. The the, the, the simplest one is the uh, pressure sensor sand probe. Um, basically, you have a, a tube that it is intrusive. Yeah. It's 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 simple. It's a chip. Uh, but you need a, a, a you know a location where you can insert the tube. This tube has a cavity basically, okay, cavity, and then it's connected to the pressure gauge. So basically, the moment this tube is eroded, okay, and then you expose the cavity to the pressure, to the pressure, and that that will trigger alarm basically. So it's it's basically just an alarming, a warning device, yeah. That will give you alarm whenever, whenever the 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 this probe is eroded, basically. Okay. So it's not going to give you uh, uh, real time data or uh, uh, real time erosion rate measurement. No. Okay. The, the slightly more advanced than that is uh, electrical resistance probe. This one is supposed to give you uh, real time erosion rate measurement because you have a 
it is intrusive also. And then you have a, 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 a kind of a probe uh, where they expect that the, it will be eroded by sand and the amount of metal loss uh, on this probe will be translated into uh, electrical resistance changes. Okay. So uh, you can have a, a real-time 24-7 measurement uh, all the time with, with this, uh, but people might question whether we place the the probe at the right location with the, the erosional, uh, erosional rate that the probe measure represent uh, the, the, the wall thickness reduction, whether we place it at the right place, there's something that we need to uh, you know, assess um, before we install this electrical resistance probe. Okay. Now we are talking about the sand control technique. Uh, we have done the uh, prediction uh, uh, monitoring. Now we are talking about the controlling the sand. Um, first, before I talk about the sand control technique, uh, maybe slight uh, introduction. Uh, not because I'm not sure how many of you uh, coming from the oil and gas industry, but basically uh, we have two type. In general, we have two type of well: uh, case hole and open hole. Case hole is uh, basically we drill a hole, uh, we run a hole the pipe, and we cement it. That's what we call case hole. Uh, in that condition, after cementing, we have no communication with the reservoir, so we need to perforate it uh, the well okay, to gain the communication. But that's what we call as a case hole. And the second type is open hole. Open hole is 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 more simple than the first one. We just drill a hole. We don't even bother to run casing. Okay. And we produce from, from that condition. It's open hole. Okay. You, you, maybe you, you might want, uh, you are wondering why uh, we do case hole if, if we can drill a well with open hole. Well, first, not all well can be completed with open hole. So some well we have to live with, uh, some well we have to complete with case hole anyway due to various reasons. Uh, one of them is the uh, isolation. Like we might encounter not only gas and oil, uh, we might encounter water uh, along the way and we don't want to produce water. Uh, so in order for that, we have to isolate that water soon. Uh, that can only be made possible with the case hole in most of the cases, even though now uh, in, the, in the new technology, we can also isolate in the case, uh, in open hole. Okay, back to the sand control. Uh, this is uh, statistically, uh, I would say the the five or six type, uh, the most popular uh, sand control method apply in oil and gas industry. Okay, the most popular one is gravel packing, okay, followed by a frag packing, okay, and then a standalone screen, uh, oriented and selective perforation. And the last is the in situ consolidation. We are going to go through uh, uh, more detail for each. Uh, so let's go straight to the first one. Okay, the most popular one is gravel packing. Um, let me zoom in first how it looked like. Uh, when we said gravel packing, we can do it in both in case hole in open hole. Uh, basically, the idea is uh, you, you can see here we have screen. Screen is a, a filtration. Uh, media uh, filtration, um, you know, metallic filtration basically. It's screen, yeah? just like strainer. Maybe you can imagine like strainer is here. And then around the screen, we fill up with the gravel. Gravel is uniform. We call it gravel or propane sometimes. We we call it with the uh, we we fill up with the uh, gravel. Okay, and then we we produce the well. Okay, that's that's the in the in the case hole in open hole. Uh, it's the same configuration, except that you don't see casing here, you don't see pipe, you don't see perforation. Okay, so um, if you look at the uh, gravel packing procedure, this is a simplified one. Uh, we first, in the case hole, you, we start with the perforating the casing. Okay, we run and hold the uh, screen to the tap, and then a screen and then gravel pack assembly. Uh, and then we pump slurry. Uh, we pump slurry is a, is a combination of gravel or propans with carrier fluid. It could be water, a gel, okay, uh, 
a gel water and we pump from the top we make sure that uh, we cover as much as possible uh, space in between screen and the uh, casing or formation okay uh, we inject as much as possible gravel into the perforation uh, and then once we we have done it uh, that's done we, we can produce the well okay uh, if you zoom in into the into the area where screen propen or gravel and formation uh, this is basically how, how it works right uh, and the screen is meant to stop propen from flowing okay it's meant to stop propen not formation sand eh? this is the formation sand this is the propen screen is meant to stop propen from flowing okay and propen uh, is meant to stop formation sand uh, to be produced okay so the, the reason why i say this so by right by right our screen is not supposed to be exposed to the formation sand by right okay most of the failure in the gravel pack occur because we don't have uniform or good uh, propan packing. So the moment we have non-uniform packing, you have a gap here, then you expose the screen to the formation. And that's where the erosion will happen. Yeah. So the moment, once the screen eroded, there is no way for the screen to hold the propan in place. So this, the propan will be produced first. And when the propan is produced, there is no way to stop the formation sign to be produced. Yeah. So um, let's let's zoom in on the uh, plus and minus. Plus point is uh, is the most robust method uh, amongst the amongst the, all the uh, same control. This is the most robust, uh, uh, provided that it's done and designed correctly. Uh, it can provide effective and good longevity. Uh, the drawback is uh, the proper placement can be tricky. Like I said earlier, I, uh, the key here is for you to ensure we have a good uniform packing behind the screen. Bear in mind, we are pumping from the top, eh, from the surface, and our uh, formation is probably 2,000, 3,000 meter downhole. Okay. Uh, so um, this is not uh, easy, but of course, uh, it's doable. Uh, with the right design, we can have a good uh, uniform packing. And the, the other drawback is it's more expensive than open hole standalone screen. We, we are going to cover standalone screen later. So uh, people always compare like, do we really need a gravel pack? Can we just uh, live with a screen only? Uh, right? It's cheaper. Okay. Uh, that's always difficult uh, uh, if you have a cheaper alternative. Okay, so uh, if you look at the, the way the way the way we design or the, the, the way the gravel pack is described here, you know that uh, we are trying to prevent condition through condition two from happening, right? Like we don't really care whether the sand fail or not, whether with the whether sand broken or not. We don't really care whether the stress is higher than the strength. Okay, uh, the the let's let's say that the formation broken uh, but gravel pack is meant to stop this sand this broken sand to be transported to the surface so we are preventing the condition to here okay um the method number two is a case hole uh, frag packing is quite similar to the gravel packing uh, the only difference is we go we squeeze we pump a lot more gravel or propane we pump a lot more slurry into the formation. Okay, how, how did we do it? We do it by deliberately fracking the formation, deliberately broken, pumping higher to crack the rock open. Okay, uh, just, just to give you some illustration, you, you see how uh, that the, the, the sand here only fill up the perforation tunnel and the area in between the the screen and the uh, casing over here the propane can go way deeper to the formation we're talking about 20 feet 50 feet deeper to the formation okay so deliberately we we in this operation we frack we we broke the formation in order for us to squeeze more gravel okay why we want to do that 
okay uh, i'll show you here why we want to do that this is the flow area uh, comparison between a gravel packing we, we covered this just now and high rate water pack is some um, we don't have time to cover that but this is somewhere in between gravel pack and track pack okay uh, with a very short uh, you know uh, frag length okay but uh, frag pack uh, we we intend to frag the formation look at the flow area comparison okay if gravel pack is one uh, with high rate water pack you can get four times flow area and we we frag pack you can get you know 30 or more uh, flow area compared to gravel pack so how that will impact what will be the, the the benefit of having a higher flow area having flow higher flow area means that lower restriction to the flow with lower restriction to the flow lower pressure drop higher production yeah so you can expect a lot higher production with the frag packing compared to gravel pack okay let's go to the plus and minus plus and minus the plus is the when when we frag when we uh, deliberately frag the we may connect more reservoir you, you can frag in one reservoir but the but the frag might propagate vertically uh, to connect more than one okay it offers the best productivity amongst all the uh, sand control uh, is less prone to the formation damage because you are producing with the uh, lower velocity you have a bigger flow area lower velocity high chance for you to mobilize you know uh, unwanted uh, fines migration to the well bore okay uh, what is the drawback the drawback is the frag when you say uh, connecting more reservoir it may also connect water zone okay or it may also connect gas zone okay or, or it may connect uh, you know unwanted uh, zone uh, so we have to bear it, we have we have to take that into consideration when we are designing it. Uh, yeah, otherwise it will offset the benefit basically, and definitely uh, because of the quantity of slurry that we pump, the pressure, uh, the equipment that we need to mobilize to conduct the frag pack, this method is more expensive than gravel pack. Okay, and similar to the frag pack, we also preventing the condition two from happening. Okay, open hole standalone screen. This is applicable if you ask me, okay? Uh, my opinion only for open hole. Okay, so I will never install a standalone screen in case hole. Uh, theoretically, it's not going to work. Uh, so let's limit uh, in the open hole, okay? Uh, as I said, it's the simplest way. You just drill a hole and then we run and hold the screen. And that's all. We can produce the well. Okay. okay. Uh, how does it work? Um, there, are, there are two uh, possible conditions here, right? Uh, uh, the first one on the left is when the, the, uh, the sand is so weak that the moment you produce the well, the formation will collapse will collapse to the uh, screen. So now, now, unlike the gravel pack, the screen here, the screen here will be exposed directly to formation sand. So the screen must be designed according to the formation sand, unlike gravel pack. In gravel pack, the screen is designed to stop propon, yeah, to stop gravel. So the, the screen will be designed according to the gravel. That's the first scenario. The second scenario here is the the formation rock strength is in the gray area. It's not too strong. It's not too weak. It will fail over time um, slowly. Okay. So if that condition happen, you will find yourself in this situation where uh, you will have a gap between screen and formation. And over time, uh, you know, the formation sand, formation sand will fill up that gap. But it takes time. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the plus point is easy and cheap. Okay, but just like anything easy and cheap, it might not be good. Okay, uh, but uh, don't 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 get me wrong. I mean, provided that we do it correctly, uh, this 
uh, open hole stands open hole stand loan stream can work okay the the the, the, the problem here is if you just apply this open hole stands everywhere without a proper design or without proper execution because execution is also critical here okay so it's not uh, the drawback is generally it has poor longevity okay uh, uh, it's at limited you know application uh, area envelope uh, so it's best apply uh, when we have a uh, open hole horizontal one and uh, clean sense okay uh, so similar to gravel pack and frag pack we also prevent uh, condition two from happening here that's that's the the the, the gist of this open hole standalone screen all right the uh, method number four is is selective perforation uh okay, let me jump slightly directly to this here right so we, we know that uh, we cover that the 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 strength okay the strength of the rock can be different at different depth okay uh, even for the same formation for the same formation um, we it's not necessarily that we're going to have one one strength one rock strength uh, along the interval okay let's say we have a uh, uh, 50 feet or 100 feet there could be a lot of variation over there okay the, the idea of selective perforation is okay why don't we perforate the strong part only okay uh, and leave the, the the weak part unperforated because we can always get uh, production from the weak part through the strong uh, part here but at the same time we prevent sand from you know we present the formation from fill as long as this strong sand intact there is no way for us to produce sand right even though we know that at the same reservoir we also have a weak portion so, but basically that, that's the that's the idea uh so let me zoom in here for example okay this is from one of the field in uh, Turkmenistan. uh remember last time uh before this i i asked you to refer to cddp uh which stand for critical drawdown pressure so whenever the critical drawdown pressure is zero definitely we are going to produce sand right? no matter what uh the higher the cddp the better it is the the bigger the safe zone so in this case uh, just just to give you an example, like we try to avoid perforating in a low CDVP area. So we are not going to perforate here. We are going to pick uh, probably the strongest part of the formation, maybe at the top, which is not too bad. It's uh, quite strong. Uh, uh, we can, you know, we can basically, uh, we selectively pick which depth you would like to perforate. Okay, so let's go to the plus and minus so it's easy and cheap uh right no no extra equipment required you just need to define uh the perforation interval which depth you're going to uh, perforate uh the drawback is when we perforate the the stronger part of the reservoir normally that is correlated with the lower permeability as well lower porosity so that stronger part will give you less production so there will be a, a price that we have to pay for that. Okay. And then another thing is the fact that we don't perforate the whole interval, we only perforate part of it, then you can expect that the flow need to converge to that per, uh, selective uh, short uh, uh, interval, right? That, that, that converging will create additional pressure drop. Again, that will impact the production. Okay, now unlike the previous three methods that I explained, this method, the selective preparation, we tackle, we're addressing the condition one. Okay, we are going to select which uh, zone, which portion of the reservoir where this condition one will never happen. Or, or kind of, we try to avoid that from happening. Yeah, control it from happening. Yeah. So that's a selective perforating uh okay um method number five is oriented perforating uh, remember when we, we talk about the stress uh, the orientation right uh this is a, a bit uh let me zoom in first uh, uh on this theoretical value okay 
Okay, so in in a well bore, uh, we we convert this uh, maximum minimum eh, maximum minimum horizontal stress and vertical stress this this orthogonal stress into polar, right? So so this is this is how how we kind of illustrate that uh, we have a tangential stress. Uh, S1 is the let's say the highest stress. S2 is the lowest stress. Yeah. So based on this, uh, in order for us to avoid the same production, we just need to make sure that, you know, tangential stress 2, okay, minus uh, the pressure, P, PW is the pressure, is less than the uh, the rock strength. U is, U is the rock strength, call it rock strength, okay? But you, we just need to remember this, that the tangential stress, ST2 minus PW less than rock strength, okay? So, and, ST, uh, tangent cell stress 2, ST2, is a, this is the formula. Okay, so our, our objective here, uh, let me go back here. Our objective is to minimize ST2, okay? And in order for us to, um, to, 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 to minimize ST2, we need, we can, all we can do is to minimize uh, 3S1 minus S2. Basically, we, we want to minimize the differential uh, stress between the highest and the lowest. Okay, in, in one in one well board, in one hole, we want to minimize it. Remember, we have three stresses, vertical and two horizontal. So the idea is by choosing the orientation, okay, we can find the minimum differential stress in between two uh to uh two principal stress okay in, in practical in practical in most of the cases people just shoot at the vertical section so imagine you have a you have a horizontal well a case here uh and then you perform it at the vertically the reason being here is in, in most of the cases especially in the in the normal uh fault environment Remember, the highest stress is the vertical overburden. That's the highest, okay? So, we need to say that the, the minimum, the maximum horizontal stress and minimum horizontal stress has a less differential stress. Okay, so that's in practice. But uh, the, the right way is to conduct a proper uh, study on that uh, through geomechanic to de determine which orientation, okay, help us to minimize this uh, differential stress uh, acting on our uh, hole or on low, our well bore. Okay, by minimizing this, we maximizing the send free envelope basically. Okay, let's look at the plus and minus. Uh, it's relatively easy. Uh, it just require a, a good understanding uh, about the the horizontal uh, stress direction. Uh, yeah, both maximum and minimum, and based on that, we uh, decide which orientation give us the best chance. Okay, uh, the drawback is uh, it still require oriented perforation tool. Once you determine the the orientation, where I'm going to perforate, for example, at the uh, certain direction. Okay, uh, let's say a vertical. Then it will be a special perforating tool to allow you to orient the charges to that direction. It's important in this case to know the stress orientation. Okay, just like the the selective perforation, we are addressing the condition one. Okay, we want to minimize the stress in this case, not not to, uh, minimize the stress, not improving the strength. Yeah, we are going to minimize the stress acting in the well bore. Okay, last but not least is uh, in situ resin consolidation. In situ resin consolidation, you can imagine just like uh, pumping glue into the formation, okay, uh, you know, uh, you know, resin glue. Um, so uh, the, the the idea is, if you can glue the sand grain, right, then we can expect a stronger rock. The the problem with with that is when you pump glue, well, you don't glue only the sand grain, you also fill up the pore space in between. Right, so so you, you might end up with a stronger rock, but also less 
porous rock. Okay, but there's a a, 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 a trick uh, to do it. Uh, like normally, normally the pumping sequence is something like this. Like uh, you pump the pre flush uh, before the main treatment, yeah, before the resin, basically just to condition the the rock. Okay, uh, to get rid of the all the water. A resin doesn't like to encounter water. After that, you pump the glue, the resin itself. Once you pump the glue, before the glue harden, right? You pump post flush. It could be a, a um, you know a mineral oil or a diesel or anything. The the post flush basically the the diesel uh, the mineral oil is meant to clear the pore space. So in ideal case, you have only have glue around the sand grain, not in the pore space. Yeah, that's that's the ideal situation. There are a lot of type of uh, resin sand concentration depending on the the way uh, the activator and the type of the resin apply. Uh, for the activator, you have external activator and internal activator. External activator means you pump external the, the activator at different stage. You pump the resin first, and then after that you pump the uh, activator. Uh, internal means you pump in one go. The same fluid contain uh, resin and activator. Okay. Uh, resin type you have the early time we have phenolic resin, but nobody uses it anymore uh, because of the environmental issue. Uh, we have epoxy resin and furan. Okay. Uh, plus and minus, uh, it's good uh, for for a bypass oil reservoir, for a thin reservoir, for secondary target. Okay, uh, it can offer good productivity. Okay, but the drawback is is limited to short perforation interval. So you cannot treat too long uh, perforation interval with this method. Okay. Again, uh, we are improving the strength of the rock, so we are addressing condition one in this case. All right. So now the question is, uh, what do we do? Really, do we really need to install sand control? Do we need to stop the sand from producing at the downhole? Right? Can we just let it produce and then we manage at the surface? Well, uh, uh, we can opt to do that, but uh, I would say that. Uh, it's quite risky. Uh, it's quite risky because uh, first, uh, you need to have a, a robust understanding uh, and should be able to quantify how much sand production that uh, you are going, you expect to see uh, while you are, we are producing the hydrocarbon. That will determine the size of the equipment, the the operating philosophy. Uh, okay, um, that's one thing. Second is when you uh, decide to handle sand on the surface. Definitely, you need something to catch the sand on the surface. Yeah, uh, you need to catch the sand. So in this case, probably you need you have a surface sander. Uh, but surface sander, uh, that equipment that you use to catch the sand, okay, it, even if it works, it can only protect anything downstream of it. Anything downstream of it, right? It's not going to protect anything upstream of it. So the risk of having this uh, sand erosion, sand deposition is still valid. It still can happen before or upstream of the uh, descender. So it is it is of our best interest to put the descender as close as possible to the well, right? Uh, the picture that you see here is a, a, a sample of what we call wellhead descender. We put surface descender close enough to the the well. Uh, this is the wing valve, okay. This is the wellhead, the Christmas tree. So very close, right? But this wellhead descender is meant to cater on the production from one well. It's not meant to cater production from all wells. So if you have uh, 50 wells, you need 50 wellhead descender, right? Whether this is a good uh, decision uh, from economic point of view, or well, this is something that uh, you know uh, people might challenge. Yeah, so uh, if we decided not to install the sand control, uh, we we might we might have a lower capex. Uh, we have we have we have very low investment in the beginning probably, but uh, likely we are going to have a higher opex. Okay, so we need to manage the sand. We need even need to think about how we're going to dispose the sand. Okay, uh, let alone if the sand is a norm like a contain radioactive, so that create a lot more complexity. And then every every problem that you have might you know affect the production later on. So, um, but 
when when I said about understanding about the the sand, uh, we are talking about this. Like uh, we need we need to define uh, MSFR is uh, sand free rate, uh, maximum sand free rate. Yeah, uh, this is MASR is maximum allowable sand rate. Right. So uh, below MSFR, you are not to produce sand. Uh, in between is is we are above that, that above that point above that blue line you're going to produce sand and you need to set up a line or with the maximum allowable sand rate that you can handle or tolerate okay which is not an easy job if you ask me the best way is always to stop the sand from its source so and then you know everybody can sleep uh, peacefully okay. even even that when even when you set to, to to install the sand control from the beginning so it is not always uh, perfect you know like in 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 many cases right uh, people are forced to handle the sand at the surface not because they plan for it no it's just because the first plan fail like the, the plan to control the sand at the, at the source fail when it fail then you are going to produce sand and then when you're going to produce sand whether we like it or not we have to handle it we have to manage it all right so in summary i think we have gone through everything like we, we started from the 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 question what are the consequences of sand production in oil and gas well why it matters then you know that we are talking about hsc here we are talking about fire hazard we are we're talking about environment hazard uh, with oil spill uh, also send a position along the production that might impact the production and operational uh, expenditure. Uh, we have covered also what cost and production. Remember the condition one, condition two, uh, you need to have these two condition happen, then you are going to see sand at the surface. Uh, we also talk about the sand prediction, uh, why we need to have sand prediction, how can it be done, uh, is through observation uh, we can use analog feel but the best is always to build a robust geomechanic models uh, so uh, uh, we also cover we go through about the uh, technique they used to detect and monitor sand production uh, we have sand sampling uh, we can install descender collect the sand that we are producing measure it uh, we also have acoustic clamp on uh, erosion probe that we can install that give us a real-time uh, erosion rate uh, data okay uh, and then uh, the technique that we use to control the sand at the surface from gravel pack right pack open hole stainless screen until the sand consolidation okay and last but not least we also uh, cover uh, or discuss about the option to manage the sand at the surface Okay, uh, my personal opinion is stopping the sand at the source is always the best option and managing sand at surface is always challenging. Okay, but sometimes, uh, you know, it is, it is, it is just as it is. I mean, we have to do it anyway. I mean, uh, in most of the cases, it is unplanned. Uh, with that, uh, I end my presentation. Uh, uh, I'll be happy to answer any question from the audience. Thank you so much. Uh, back to you, uh, uh, Anati. Okay, Palatif, thank you very much. Uh, we have few questions here. Okay, the first question with regards to the electrical resistant probe. How do you deploy the equipment down hole? We need to pull the tubing or just use the client. And usually, how long, how long can this equipment last in Malaysia? Okay, this question from engineer Raza. Okay, thank you for, for the uh, question. Yeah, uh, probably I didn't mention clearly that this erosion probe we install it at the surface only. Uh, um, so it's it, it's quite easy to 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 install it back uh, whenever you have you know whenever the probe gone or fully eroded, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the reason being is you rarely see any risk of erosion downhole except for the screen. Uh, most of the erosion happen at the surface when the, the velocity is the highest. You know, even if you're producing gas, uh, you have a lower pressure at the surface, right? So with the lower pressure, you have a higher velocity. And some more, uh, 
uh, in the surface you have a lot of band, uh, you have a lot of valve, uh, choke, that's where likely you are going to have erosion. So it makes more sense to install erosion probe at the surface. However, however we do have tool to measure the, the thickness of the uh, tubing downhole if required. So we can run uh, what we call multi-finger imaging tool. It's basically a, 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 a lock to, to measure the thickness of our uh, tubing. Uh, we can do it uh, periodically, maybe once every a few years just to monitor but the, the the this this tool will 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 measure the thickness right so it could be a combination between erosion and corrosion not not necessarily erosion only i hope that answer your question uh, okay we have one more question from engineer as also looks like uh he's quite interested uh with this topic today so for malaysia environment it is mostly better to treat the same production issues at subsurface or using subsurface uh, subsurface facilities. Oh, okay, so it is not only in Malaysia, but I would say worldwide uh, in this industry, it's always better to stop the problem from its source, uh, which is in this case, uh, better to uh, control the sand at the downhole before it's, it's trifling to the surface and creating more damage. But but uh, uh, that downhole sand control require investment. Okay, so that's that's what I mean by higher capex. You need to invest early uh, for the downhole sand control. Um, otherwise, right, you, you can you can you can decide. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not going to install the downhole sand control. I'm going to manage the the sand at the surface. But likely that you may incur more uh, uh, OPEX later uh, during the operation. And on top of that, the production might be impacted. Okay, thank you so much, Palate, for the great technical talk today. Solid detailed explanation for every single element on your presentation. So I hope this session uh, will give you the opportunity to gain new knowledge and everyone is clear about what Patif has presented in our, in our talk today. So ladies and gentlemen, before we end this session, I would like to inform you that if you are interested to join any IEM events that she talks and visit organized by OGMTV, please refer to www.myiem.org.my slash events. On behalf of OGMTD, I would like to sincerely thank you once again for your participation. So, anything from Palatif before we end the session? Uh, no, it's, it's good experience for me. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how many of you coming from the oil and gas industry. Sometimes I was thinking like whether I go to, uh, you know, to I use terminology which are aliens to you or. Um, but you know, uh, it's, it's it's good to even if you're not from oil and gas, uh, it's good to have this kind of you know uh, talk uh, discussion. Uh, I can learn from you as much as probably you learn from me uh, during this session. Okay, Palati, we have another one more question here. Is there yeah. is there a need to break emulsion in the well to help remove the sand from the uh, Yes, but, but rarely people do that because, again, for the practical reason, uh, oh, I, I see where it's coming from. Like, uh, because I told you about that emulsion will create a more viscous fluid and more viscous fluid will create more pressure drop, more pressure drop will uh, will reduce the production, right? Uh, uh, so uh, I, think, I think you are thinking about, okay, so if I stop the problem earlier, okay, closer to the source, it will be better. Yes, you are right. But but uh, that takes a lot of more investment. Uh, it is not easy to to. I mean, not few company probably invest in injecting the emulsifier downhole. In most of the cases, like they treat it at the surface. That's that's the the reality. Uh, but I, I see where where you're coming from. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Once again, on behalf of our organization. Uh, OGMTD committee. Have a nice weekend. Stay safe and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.